So welcome all. Silvernet is embarking on a new series called Aliyev Watch. I'm joined by Silvernet host and analyst Eric Hakopian to unpack the actions and statements of Azerbaijani President Ilham Aliyev. On April 29th, an international conference took place in Baku called South Caucasus Development and Cooperation. It was chaired by Aliyev. Guests from around the world were invited to pose questions to the Azerbaijani president, primarily about issues orbiting the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. We are going to go through some of the statements Aliyev made during the conference. And Eric, I want to get your take. Thank you. So first off, Eric, have a listen to this. Armenians who live in Karabakh, we consider them our citizens. And we hope that they will also soon understand that living as citizens of Azerbaijan, they will have all rights and their security will be protected. Azerbaijan, unlike Armenia, is a multi-ethnic country and all uh, ethnic groups who live here live in peace and dignity, including Armenians. We have Armenian minority and there will never any issue with that respect. Uh, but of course, for that, uh, there should be put an end to Azerbaijanophobic propaganda in Armenia. So here, Aliyev was stating that Azerbaijan is a multi-ethnic country where the rights of minorities are, ex are respected. What came to mind when you heard this? Uh, what came to mind is his speech to his own people that contradicts all of that. <laughs> İti govan kimi govur onları? İti govan kimi Azerbaycan askeri onları govur? Well, obviously this whole thing is farcical. You know, there's actually two Aliyevs. There's the one for Western consumption. And he said this before. He said it to France 24 during the war, I believe. Talking about Armenians that are living in Baku, the imaginary ones that no longer exist. There are no, there are a few hidden Armenians, I suspect, in inner, inner ethnic marriages that exist, that live in hiding. Uh, with their uh, usually with their Azeri husbands, but um, there's really uh, there is no Armenian population. In fact, uh, by by their laws, it's actually illegal to be an Armenian in Azerbaijan. You can't even enter the country. So uh, this notion that he's going to treat them as citizens is farcical, considering that you, if they were actually your citizens, you're trying to shoot them and kill them multiple times, intimidate them, and actually complain to your own media that how the Russians are not helping uh, the process of ethnically cleansing the region. And you constantly actually brag to your media that there's only 25,000 Armenians left, which is entirely not true. So obviously he has this Western message that he tells these uh, uh, fools and degenerates that gathered at this conference. And then there's the actual or what he tells his own people and there's a complete absolute contradiction between the two and frankly it's our job to expose it okay eric now have a listen to this because you know we know how armenia government and diaspora works they think that the whole world owes them everything and someone will come and defend them someone will come and fight for them someone will come and give them money give them everything and they will sit and just exploit their questionable and uh, how to say very doubtful so-called tragedy. So here Aliyev refers to the Armenian diaspora and the doubtful historical facts which many saw as a reference to the Armenian genocide and many other instances of ethnic cleansing against Armenians. What did you think when you heard this? Well I mean he essentially called himself what he is which is a genocide denier. It doesn't, I mean, what he says about the diaspora is irrelevant. Uh, he doesn't know anything about our diaspora, anywhere to comment on it, but he's essentially a genocide denier. And here he is, he's talking about, you know, he always talks about peace and uh, these are our citizens and he wants to deny the most basic facts of history, which are recognized by the entirety of the world, except his country and, a, you know, his cohort fascist state in Turkey. So uh, this tells you a lot about his mindset, that he's willing to stand there or sit there in front of an international audience and become a genocide denier, which is uh, in the ranks of, uh, you know, political positions you can take is about as, as low as you can get anywhere in the world. Okay, here's the next one. Uh, when uh, EU announced 2.6 billion euros support to Armenia and 140 or 160 million to Azerbaijan, of course, uh, we raised our voice and on the very high level. 
So Aliyev here laments that the EU will grant Armenia 2.6 billion euros over the next five years, whilst Azerbaijan only gets 150 uh, million euros uh, around that number. Not fair, right? Well, I think you need to understand his comments on... Uh uh, first of all, this is really the, the paradoxical is that, you know, he's always talking about how rich his country is and, you know, we're rich and independent and Armenia is, is poor and miserable and all these things. Well, and, and then now he's complaining about not getting any money. Well, which one is it, big boy? I mean, do you have the money or you don't have the money? But I don't think this is about that. I think this is more about legitimacy. And this is a man who has serious legitimacy issues historically. And I think in his mind, he still does and insecurities and money from an institution like the EU is actually an affirmation of your uh, one democratic development, political development, uh, development in the, in, the, in the course of human rights uh, and uh, your actual real economic prospects for the future. So uh, what he's really complaining about is not getting the stamp of approval of legitimacy by people that he really craves legitimacy from. You know, uh, Erdogan saying good things about him or other authoritarian leaders or Lukashenko, you know, saying good things about him doesn't get him anything. He wants acceptance and legitimacy by people who he knows at the end of the day uh, don't think much of him. Mm. And here's the next one. There have been uh, thousands of tens of thousands of uh, international representatives visiting Shusha, and all of them saw that Armenian church is untouched. On the contrary, it will be also restored. So Armenian churches have been untouched, is that right? Well, he's a pathological liar. You even have photos of the top of the Shushi you know, cathedral being taken down. They've taken down the famous angels and they've actually destroyed other, um, they've, you know, ground down to zero entirety of churches and they've distorted others claiming that they belong to others and, you know, all these mythic nonsensical Albanian stuff that they talk about. Uh, so this is just a flat out lie. And, and I think we need to understand this in the context of, uh, uh, it's not simply his political insecurities, it's really the insecurities of their culture. Uh, because he uh, uh, he and his country have, uh, you know, uh, insecurities about who they are and what they are because, uh, and it's not, uh, and it's not unfounded, you know, the south of them is a 3,000 year old Persian civilization recognized around the world. To the north of them is the Slavic Russian civilization, which regardless of current issues is deeply embedded into Western culture. And his two other neighbors, immediate neighbors, are, you know, a millennia long historic countries, Armenia and Georgia. Uh, so what are they and what is he? Uh, if he claims uh, historically they're some kind of a Persianized, you know, Turkified tribe who speak, you know, just very much like their cohorts in Iran, the Azeris of Iran, which are deeply indented into Persian culture. So he can't become Persian because you'll be eaten up by that culture. You can't be, you're not Russian, obviously, and you're really not even Turkish. Uh, so the, his entire narrative, and in fact, the narrative of his country is based on negative identity of what they're not. And mm -hmm. essentially they define themselves in opposition to others rather than a building on uh, the fundamentals of their own society. And, and frankly, there's absolutely no reason for them to be insecure. There's lots of new countries, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Syria goes back 3,000 years. Jordan goes back 100 years. Uh, UAE goes back, you know, a few decades. And none of these people have these head case uh, is with uh, historic countries around them. Uh, this really talks about their deep uh, lack of respect for themselves. Uh, and that lack of respect for themselves leads to this kind of uh, aggressive, ugly, you know, uh, fascist type behavior and thinking. Mm -hmm. And his comments are essentially that in flat out lying form. Mm -hmm. Okay, and here's the next one. There have been attempts to, uh, how to say, advise us that we need uh, to consider issue related to our territorial integrity. And I was always saying no. Uh, I was saying that never Azerbaijan, myself, and the people of Azerbaijan will agree to create another Armenian fake state on our territory, never. 
So Eric, what did you think when you heard that? Very simple. This is actually quite useful because what he is really saying is that the entire negotiating process that he was uh, and his dad were taking part in was a farce because every scenario prior to the start of the war had two elements in it that what the international community considered the occupied territories would need to be returned to uh, Aliyev's country and uh, that there would be either full recognition, independence, or some mid-level recognition uh, for the Artsakh Republic as something that is separate uh, on whatever level of recognition there is. So what he's really saying here is that we've been lying for 30 years mm -hmm. uh, and that we will never accept a scenario outside of uh, an ethnically cleansed Artsakh. What he's actually given us here is actually on a gold platter uh, that all communication, that all negotiations with him are farcical. And the only action to take is for international recognition and international, most importantly, international protections for the Armenian residents of Artsakh because you're dealing, there's only one peace partner here and that's the Artsakh side and the Armenian side. He is not a peace partner. He it will play the game until he get what he wants, which is an ethnically cleansed Artsakh without any Armenians in it. That's his only play. And he's actually outright saying it here. Mm -hmm. Okay, Eric, well, have a listen to the next one. I think that they don't have a clear understanding and uh, put down all the illusions, put down all attempts to rebuild the army, become stronger, to have 5 million population, which they announced as their state program, and then to take back the territories. That will be the end of the statehood, official end. So here he says that Armenia should not rebuild its army. What do you think of that? Again, I think this is the second most revealing thing here is, uh, I think what he's really telling you is, are, is what his fears are mm. and uh, what we should be doing. <laughs> uh, first and foremost, what country has been wiped out by having a stronger army and a bigger population? So that's like, a, a, that's like a idiotic statement on its own anyway. It's farcical. Mm -hmm. uh, but what he's, what he's saying is that this is what I fear. Uh, and what he's saying is exactly what we should do. Because that's the language. He's, he's telling you what language he understands. Mm -hmm. uh, and until you can change that equation, you know, he is going to continue his aggression and bullying. So this is very good. He's giving us our master plan of what needs to be done. Uh, because this is the only thing that will change the equation when it comes to dealing with him. So uh, this is quite revealing and we should thank him for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, here's the next one. What happened after the war demonstrates that we don't have any, uh, any bad intentions. We want peace. So Aliyev has said time and time again that he desires peace with Armenia. Is he sincere? I mean, this is just, it, it's, it's Orwellian to, the, uh, to a T. You know, he pieces war, and uh, if he was interested in peace, uh, he would be outreaching to the uh, Armenians of Artsakh, mm -hmm. uh, making their lives easier, mm -hmm. uh, bringing them into the fold, saying how life would be wonderful under his rule. Uh, he would not be crossing and occupying parts of Armenia. He would not be threatening, uh, uh, you know, because in the previous statement, he talks about the end of the Armenian state what yeah. does that mean that's a you know genocidal threat uh he would not be making uh, uh claims on armenian proper territory so this is just a flat out lie and it's a you know and anybody with any sense understands that he's flat out not telling the truth here mm. okay i want to uh i want you to listen now to a few of the guests okay. at the conference uh, thank you very much. It's good to be back in Baku. Uh, since we last met, um, the situation has changed considerably, uh, and I certainly find it possible to congratulate you personally and the people of Azerbaijan for this very significant achievement uh, to put right a very significant wrong that, it ex that had existed for far too long. Hello, Mr. President. Thank you for hosting us, and especially in the beautiful uh, Shusha. Um, I'm currently a professor at the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School and very happy to be here in Azerbaijan. Morning, uh, Mr. Morning. President. 
Um, thank you very much for the invitation. It was a real pleasure and honor uh, to come here and to have the opportunity uh, to visit Shusha. That's something that I wanted to do for a very long time. So it was a, a dream come true, if I can put it that way. So, Eric, we saw a number of representatives, even from Western countries, a lot of Western countries, congratulating Aliyev on his glorious liberation of Karabakh. Mm -hmm. What did you think when you were hearing these individuals speak? When I heard the Western ones, it reminded me of this famous uh, line that uh, Malcolm X had about American democracy. And I think in this, you can sort of take it and play it onto the West as a whole. When he said, we learn, we've learned a lot about American, we've, we haven't learned much about American democracy, but we learned much about American hypocrisy. So I think what you have here is uh, Western hypocrisy because um, all of these people praising him for the ethnic cleansing and genocidal actions in Artsakh. Uh, all of these people, I will guarantee you, are the last person uh, are against uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Properly so. Uh, but I would need to ask them, and they need to ask themselves, one thing that Vladimir Putin has done that Aliyev has not done. You cannot find one. However, I can point out to three or four things that Aliyev has said, specifically, that Putin has never said. Uh, Putin has never called Ukrainians dogs. He's never tried to ethnically cleanse them, even though lots of Ukrainians have left. That's not his. There are in the areas occupied by Russians right now. There are Ukrainians that are still living there. So uh, this is the hypocrisy of the West, where they'll go in this, in these, you know, these pathetic half men or whoever these people are, go to these conferences, you know, for the either they get paid for it or they get a free ride and they have to humiliate themselves by asking questions like this. But uh, it's hard to uh, it's hard to have any respect for this for people of this ilk. Mm -hmm. But there was one man who had a different approach. Have a listen to this. Unfortunately, some other Iranians who attend uh, the summit spoke openly against uh, the territorial integrity and the national security of Iran. We hear a lot of news about the basis of the Soviet era maps. Uh, which official map of the Soviet Union was agreed uh, uh, between you and Armenia and Russia? So there was one man at the conference that kind of challenged Mr. Aliyev, the Iranian representative. He spoke about how Azerbaijan has used old Soviet maps to justify territorial claims. He also spoke about how many Azerbaijani figures have made claims on Iranian territory, primarily in the north and west of the country. So what did you think of this Aga challenging the Sultan? He's a profile in courage. <laughs> uh, uh, to go there uh, in a country like that, in which you can be disappeared, uh, even if you're a foreigner, to say that, uh, and to challenge this, uh, you know, this dictator in those terms, uh, it's quite courageous. And it also tells you uh, is who has a greater sense of history and understanding, because I suspect a lot of the Western actors were there, don't even know the details of the history of the region. Uh, and uh, this is a man who clearly understands the real history of the region and what it means, and he's actually willing to stand up there and uh, challenge this thug in his own terms. Yeah. Interesting that a representative of a theocracy challenged Aliyev, whereas multiple representatives of countless Western universities, Western NGOs, even the U.S. Navy did not. Well, I think I've, I've, I've answered it previously. I don't want to harp on it any further, but <clears throat> listen, I think it's as... Uh, uh, in the world of academia, in these worlds that a lot of its people come from, it's, they don't like to admit it, but a good chunk of them are for sale. And if you would actually make yourself, if you're actually willing to go to a conference like this, uh, you're already telling the world what kind of person that you are, is because you're essentially willing to go there and uh, be humiliated. Mm -hmm. uh, and be lied to and be used as a front for a regime that none of these people would want to live under. Mm. So finally, Eric, I mean, this was just one conference of, of many other instances of Aliyev's statements and appearances. What were your general impressions? What do you think of the man and any final thoughts? I think my final thoughts is uh, uh, there is no greater indictment of every Armenian political leader from Levant Petrosian to Nikol Pashinyan 
to every Armenian institution, to the Armenian military, to the Armenian diaspora, to the entirety of the Armenian nation, that we actually lost a war to this guy. That tells you uh, how badly we bundled things, bungled things, for us to actually lose to a degenerate like him. Uh, second thing when you look at him is, uh, you know, first of all, watching this for hours, it's like, uh, you know, long periods of boredom, boredom you know, uh, broken up by small spurts of fascism. Uh, he is the worst thing in the context of modern world. He's a bore. You know, if you listen to him, you know, with, uh, most of the time he put a dead man to sleep in a cemetery at midnight. Uh, there's absolutely nothing uplifting in, or interesting in what he says. Uh, in fact, recently I've been reading the reviews of the uh, Bin Laden tapes, mm -hmm. and uh, it's obviously the man is wrong about almost everything, but he's far more worldly and far more interesting. You know, he mm -hmm. talks about the impact of Arab Spring, French music, and, mm -hmm. and there's absolutely nothing uplifting about this man politically. I mean, there's no, there's no there there. He's just this big ball of insecurity. Uh, and I think we need to understand one thing uh, about this whole, this conference is like this. What is the purpose of a conference like this? The, con the purpose of a conference like this is that he actually gets to lie. We have to understand the importance of lying for a totalitarian state. Uh, lying in the context of a totalitarian state is actually a power trip because the, the object uh, is to humiliate. He actually humiliated all the people who sat there and all totalitarian states by constantly lying or humiliating their population and disempowering them. So that's the purpose of this uh, and this constant uh, panoply of lies. People sitting there know he's lying. He mm. knows he's lying. And both sets of people know that the other ones are lying. So what this is, is this is the projection of his insecurities. Mm. And his insecurities, you know, uh, can only be covered up by his ability to empower you and humiliate you, in this case, his guests, by saying things that he knows himself are absolutely not true. But it is actually quite purposeful and quite uh, deliberate. Mm. Well, at least Bin Laden used to wear bell bottoms. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, Eric, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And thank you for joining us on CivilNet. Thank <laughs> you.